morning. Here we are back at Romans chapter 1, and we're down in verse 18 and following there. The heading here in, uh, well, let's see now. I'm supposed to be for Romans. I'm supposed to be in the New American Standard. So here we go again. Let's see what the heading is here. God's wrath on unrighteousness. The righteous shall live by faith in verses 16 and 17. Um, verse 17, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. Okay, but in contrast, verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed. And so those are the things that we want to look into uh, today. So let's pray. Father, we ask your blessing as we come to your word. We pray that you would grant us uh, strengthened faith, that we would believe your word, that we would uh, be fully trusting in the good news of Christ, that we would trust in Christ and for our salvation. Thank you that you have granted us a righteousness which is perfect, which is not which does not originate in us, but comes to us from Christ and who, who, who bore our sins on the cross. And so we thank you and praise you for this great salvation and your mercy toward us. And we pray that you would bless now the study of your word in Christ's name. Amen. Let's see now. I get mixed up as to what, what I did when and uh, I don't know if it was in Ephesians. It might have been in the Ephesians study. Maybe it was in the Romans. I don't remember. But anyway, um, I had uh, shared the, the verses from a hymn, not what these uh, hands have done, which was written by Horatius Bonar. All right, this is an old volume of it, Horatius Bonar. He was... Uh, uh, pastor back in the 1800s in Scotland, and uh, he wrote over 600 hymns, some of which are um, in, in, for instance, the Trinity, the Trinity hymnal, but it wasn't just um, Horatius Bonar, but there's Andrew Bonar, and there's also John or James Bonar, James was the uh, the eldest of them, and uh, I just wanted to read to you. Um, well, first of all, let me for those of you that didn't hear before when I did this before. Um, here's a hymn that is uh, perfect for uh, studying um, Romans, definitely with with Romans. Uh, also, <laughs> the Ephesians study that we've been looking at. So let's see. I might have. Did I ask Verla? Did I ask? Yes. Are we going to sing this hymn? Yeah, we're going to sing this hymn in the worship service tomorrow. So, not what these hands have done. Listen to these words. If it's repetitious, that, that's all right. Not what these hands have done can save this guilty soul. Right. Until somebody eyes are open to that, they're going nowhere as far as salvation. Not what these hands have done can save this guilty soul. Not what this toiling flesh has borne can make my spirit whole. Not what I feel or do can give me peace with God. Not all my prayers and sighs and tears can bear my awful load. Thy work alone, O Christ, can ease this weight of sin. Thy blood alone, O Lamb of God, can give me peace within. Thy love to me, O God, not mine, O Lord, to thee, can rid me of this dark unrest and set my spirit free. Thy grace alone, O God, to me can pardon speak. Thy power alone, O Son of God, can this sore bondage break. I bless the Christ of God, I rest on love divine, and with unfaltering lip and heart, I call this Savior mine. So there's a, a great hymn, those old 
hymns like that are, are filled every verse with sound uh, biblical doctrine in, uh, in, in the gospel. And so, um, yeah, we'll sing that in the worship service tomorrow. Anyway. More words in the hymn. Oh, there's actually more. There's another verse. There's one, so one two, three, four, five, six verses here. But they're, and in the, I don't know. It doesn't compare exactly. Oh, okay. In the Trinity hymn. We'll see tomorrow. Um, okay, so in relation to this, this is the little uh, Banner of Truth magazine. You, if you go to the Banner of Truth website, you can subscribe to this. And uh, um, it has some great articles in it. And I, I noticed that I just subscribed to it. But in the October 2023 issue, it has an ar article uh, I noticed. John James Bonar the eldest of the three Bonar brothers. So uh, I'm just going to read you a little excerpt of this just to get you kind of familiar with these, with some church history here. Sunday, May 15th, 1881 was a memorable day for the congregation of St. Andrew's Free Church, Greenock, a town on the southwest coast of Scotland. Almost two years had passed since the congregation had vacated the building that had housed them for the first 40 years of their history. And now at last their new building was ready for use. It had seating for over 800. That was back in the days when people came to church. And they, and it, the 800 congregation wasn't the result of uh, mega church um, heresy and so on. But at any rate, had seating for over 800. It was full of light from its great windows and was so constructed that speaking was an easy task. Uh, the, the acoustics, in other words, no microphones. And there were three services that day. And now here we go. And three preachers that preached were brothers. John James Bonar, uh, the free St. Andrew's Church ministry, or minister, rather. And then his brothers, Horatius Bonar and Andrew Bonar. John preached from Acts 3, and 23 on Christ the prophet. Horatius preached from Hebrews 5, 1 and 2 on Christ the priest. And Andrew from Revelation 19, 16 on Christ the King. Two of these brothers are remembered to this day, Horatius for his hymns and Andrew for his biography of Robert Murray McShane. John, by contrast, has largely been forgotten. It's a pleasure to introduce him to you. And then it has the early years here. John James Bernard was the oldest of the three brothers and was born in Edinburgh, on March 25th, 1803, some 16 and a half years later, on September 30th, 1819, his father recorded the following in his diary. My son John has expressed today his wish to become a minister, a determination with which I am well pleased, provided only I shall find it to be from motives of real love to God and desire to be useful to others in their immortal concerns. He would not be the first Bernard to serve the Scottish church in this way. An uncle, a grandfather, a great-grandfather, and a great-great-grandfather were all ministers too. So these three brothers were very privileged to be born in that family. In April 1827, John was licensed to preach by the Presbytery of Edinburgh, and two years later became an assistant to Dr. George Brewster uh, in Fife. This day, writes one of his relatives, our much beloved John left us to enter on his work at Fife. Sincerely do I pray that he may be made useful in that position to which the Lord has called him. Lord, do thou honor him to be successful in winning souls to Christ. Bless him and make him a blessing. After quoting these words in a sermon preached after John's death, the preacher, 
Reverend John Cunningham added, This prayer was very graciously answered. He knew much of the joy of harvest during the five years in which he labored at Leaven. Well, <clears throat> his connection, the article goes on with the congregation at Greenock, began in 1834 when he was appointed assistant to Dr. John Scott, minister of the Middle Parish there since 1793. A stroke in 1829 had disabled Dr. Scott for public ministry, and when a search began for a colleague and successor, John Benar was named as a suitable candidate. He was on the eve of his appointment to Fife, however, so choice was made instead of one of John's close friends, William Cunningham, it was after Cunningham's acceptance of a call to the Trinity Church College in Edinburgh, 1834, that, att that attention turned again to John Bernard. So anyway, he's going to become the pastor of the Free Church then um, there, St. Saint, Saint Andrews. And the article goes on. I mean, that gives you a little bit of a taste of some of the articles <clears throat> you can find um, in this here. The uh, that other pastor, Scottish pastor named William Cunningham, you can also get his works today too. Hi. Sounds like I'm a banner of truth salesman, but this is also banner of truth. Here he's written the Reformers and the Theology of the Reformation. That's uh, by William Cunningham, and I think he's got I think another two volumes set here somewhere by him. Uh, Oh, yes, on historical theology uh, is, is written there, too. So, anyway, uh, that's a little background of the Bernard brothers, and certainly you can tell from this hymn, not what these hands have done, that they understood and preached the true gospel that we're looking at right here in Romans chapter 1. Now, last time, you remember, we looked at verses 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, which is a way of saying, I am very proud of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it's written, but the righteous man shall live by faith, or the righteous shall live by faith. Now, um, we looked, uh, just a quick review here, at the fact that um, <clears throat> the gospel's the power of God for salvation. The word of God is powerful, all right? Sharper than a two-edged sword. All right, there, there it is. The word of God's powerful. God speaks and it's done. So here's the thing. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. When the gospel is preached, all right, when the gospel is preached, when the, the message of salvation uh, by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone, is preached, it is accompanied with the power of God. Now, it's either going to be power for salvation to those who believe, or it's going to be power for condemnation, but it's always, it is always effective. John chapter 3 says, not only says, verse 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes shall not perish but have everlasting life. But it goes on to say, those who don't believe are already Condemned. So his word is powerful. And, uh, and even through us, and here's the, here's the amazing thing. The power is in the message, not the messenger, because it's the power of God. So when a preacher today or a Christian today shares or preaches the gospel, truly and accurately without tweaking it to make to entertain people because that guts it of the power of God. God won't 
bless the preaching of a false gospel. But when that gospel is shared, Paul says he's not ashamed of it. This is how God saves people. That's what he's saying here. It's powerful. Now, when you have sat in church and heard the gospel preached, I mean, you don't see lightning bolts and things going off, and you don't hear a thundering voice from heaven. But nevertheless, the most common and typical way that people come to Christ, and this is why it's so important to, to faithfully keep the Lord's day and to whatever degree is possible, gather together with God's people at church to hear the Word of God preach. Nowadays, it's getting harder and harder to find a place where the Word of God is genuinely preached. And that's why we have an online ministry here, so that we can reach people who don't have a faithful church to go to. But um, you, the, the thing is that when the gospel is truly preached, um, as in a church setting, for example, on the Lord's Day, um, as I said, you don't see sparks flying and, and so forth. Nevertheless, we're told here that God accompanies that message with, with power. And as his elect are there, that power is going to go off and regenerate in God's time, in his time. Uh, it's going to regenerate and bring to life a dead person, uh, right? And give them eyes to see and ears to hear that message of salvation and he grants them faith all of those things are wrapped up in this statement it is the pow the gospel is the power of god for salvation all right and then we looked at in verse 17 in it the righteousness of god is revealed from faith to faith and we looked at that curious little construction there faith from faith to faith and with lloyd jones's help here we, uh, I mean, there's, everybody that believes the Bible and understands the gospel recognizes that the big picture here is that the righteousness of God established by Jesus Christ is imputed or credited to everyone who believes, and it's by faith alone, all right? It's entirely of faith, not of works. That much everybody is agreed on. Um, but but uh, I think that the way Lloyd Jones and I and really Robert Haldane that we're using here in our study um, is essentially says the same thing that we saw this last time that it is here's how here's the the meaning of it the righteousness of God which is by faith the by faith righteousness the righteousness of god not the righteousness of god by which he is righteous that would be bad news because we are unrighteous right but the righteousness of god available to us in, in effected by jesus christ um that righteousness which is not our own it's not the result of works the righteousness of God by faith, as I said, the by faith righteousness of God is revealed to faith. And I think this is the, the, that revealed word is connected with the power of God, that by God's power, when the gospel is preached in God's perfect timing, the eyes and the ears of the elect are opened and faith is granted and it's like once i was blind now i see okay that's that's what this is that's what this is talking about the righteous shall live by faith now all that by way of review but what we want to come to now is the contrast okay um Verse 18, for, because the wrath of God, all right, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men 
who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because, and then he's going to go on and talk about why this is true and how sinners suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So, why do people need the gospel? Why do they need Christ? Why do they be, need... Okay, I remember R.C. Sproul talking about this one time. He, he was saying that it really kind of bugs him when a, a Christian or somebody would come up and say, uh, are you saved? Are you saved, you know? And he was telling about one time that that happened and it got him... To think, he says, I always want to ask these people, saved from what? So, a valid question, right? Are you saved? I mean, to be saved is to be saved from some peril or, well, what's the peril? And oftentimes they would, if you ask them that, saved from what? Uh, a well-meaning, even Christian would come back and say, well, saved from hell. Saved from the penalty of your sins, Right? Um, all, all those kinds of things, which are true. But fundamentally, as we see here in verse 18, to be saved is to be saved from God. All right? When we are still dead, when a person is still dead in their sins, they are enemies of God, and God is their enemy. Now, that's a big problem. That's the biggest problem. You have, you have people who don't want to give a thought to God, right? And they're just happy and everything going great, it seems like, in, in, their, in their life. They haven't got a problem in the world. Oh, yeah, they do. They have a big problem. That God is their enemy. Their creator is their enemy. The wrath of God is on them. They are under, you might say, the wrath of God. You remember, if you've been following the Ephesians study, Ephesians chapter 2. You know, before you Gentiles were saved, you were uh, strangers to the covenants of promise um, that God had given to the Jews. You were um, alienated from God. You were without hope and without God in the world, and you were by nature, here it is, children of wrath. By, by nature, by your very nature, by the very um, essence of who you were before Christ saved these Ephesians, who you were, you were objects of God's wrath. All right, there, there, there it is. And that is the condition. Now, now, of course, you tell people that today, and, and if, if you're going to share the gospel with them, that's where you have to begin. You have to begin with the fact that they're under God's condemnation. And, and most people will absolutely scoff at that, deny that. They'll call you some, some fanatic, tell you to, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to hear, don't, don't, you know, keep your religion to yourself, all right? Well, Paul's about to show us what's really going on in their head and what's, what they're really up to uh, in, by their means of their very nature of, of who they are. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven. It's, it's made God from heaven has made his wrath evident here on earth. Okay, he's made it evident. Everybody, everybody sees it. The catch is they suppress that knowledge. They choose to turn a blind eye to it. So his wrath is being demonstrated right now. I wouldn't be surprised. Let's see, verse 18, 118. Let's check this out here just a second here. Roman, <coughs> back over to the <coughs> Greek New Testament here, one eighteen here. Um, okay, 
a spin wheel. Here's, here's that right here. Um, this is the phrase right here. Um, gar or gay theyu. Okay, now, actually, some of those words, if you, if you hear them, they're kind of familiar to you. Like theyu comes from theos. Theos. God, all right? And then there. The, the wrath word is this or gay. Or gay. Or gay. It kind of sounds like a, a wrathful word or so. And then here's the from heaven. Uranus. I know that's, that's heaven. Um, and then, but anyway, um, Paul, what, what happens in Greek is that, I mean, I still remember a few things from studying Greek. What happens in Greek is, instead of bold face and underline, or all caps, if you want to emphasize something, they, they would put the word right at the first, they'd make it the first word of the sentence. This is why you can't um, just literally word for word translate Greek into English. It wouldn't make any sense. I mean, if you were to read this word for word, um, is being revealed for wrath of God from heaven. You see, it doesn't, it doesn't make any, any sense there. You, you have to recognize the word order. But the first word that Paul uses here is this one. Um, uh, actually, this word here you might be a, a little familiar with, with one of its r related words, apocalypse. Okay, the, the book of Revelation is called the uh, apocalypsis of, of Christ, or the uh, the, the revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And this one, that's what this one is. You can see, that, you know, the pi there is a P. Apo, kal, there's the L. Kal, uptetai, uptetai. And uh, I guess what you would probably call that verb is, um, I won't go into the details, it's, it, it's a present tense. I think that's the, the case, if I'm getting that right. And, and in Greek, when you have a verb that's in, the, that's in the present tense, it means not only present time, but continuous action. And that's the point that I wanted to make, continuous action. For the wrath of God is being revealed moment by moment right now from heaven. Okay? God right now, moment by moment from heaven, is revealing, showing, making it evident, his wrath evident to everybody. If they'll just open their eyes to it and quit blinding themselves to it. The wrath of God, is, and, and Paul's going to show us how, how this is done here pretty quick. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against. So God is against the wicked. He's against mankind who rejects Christ. Um, he's against the sinner. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against what? All ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Okay, so here we have this <clears throat> man is ungodly, all right? Everything that God is, man the sinner isn't. He's the opposite of that. God is holy. Man isn't holy. God is righteousness. Man is unrighteousness. So this is just a way of saying that the wrath of God right now is upon all ungodly and unrighteous men. Okay? And here is... Have you ever wondered what the chief 
sin is that arouses God's wrath more than anything else. All right? Here is the fundamental thing. <clears throat> God has revealed himself um, in many ways, as we're going to see in a moment. <clears throat> One of the ways he's revealed himself is sending Christ in, into the world. <clears throat> but every time God reveals himself, all right, whenever, whenever God speaks, what does the sinner do? He suppresses that message. He suppresses the truth in unrighteousness. He doesn't want to hear the truth about God's existence, about the attributes of God, about the sinner's own lost and wicked and sinful condition. All right, he, he doesn't, that's the truth, but he didn't want to hear about it, so he suppresses it. And once again, I wouldn't be surprised if you looked back in the Greek, you'd find that this suppress business verb is a present tense continuous action, right? The wrath of God is being revealed moment by moment from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who moment by moment are suppressing the truth in their unrighteousness, right? They are, God is righteous, the sinner is unrighteous. Everything about God is right. Everything about man, the sinner, is unright, okay? Is, is unrighteous and, and ungodly. This is the characteristic. It doesn't matter how noble a person might seem, how even moral, you know, the greatest philanthropist in the world. If they reject Christ, they reject God's revelation of, of himself. If they reject his truth, they are ungodly, they are unrighteous, and God's wrath is burning uh, against them. And he's revealed his wrath. How? He, he has communicated in absolutely clear terms to everybody, everybody, that things are not right between him and them, that, that his wrath is upon them. Well, how has he done this? All right? And we've already started to see, all right, here, what is the chief sin of man? What is the chief sin of man? Well, he suppresses the truth about God. Now think about this. In order for you to hold, and that suppress means hold it down so I don't have to see it. Keep it down there. Keep it down there. And man is constantly doing that. Constantly doing that. You can see it in action. If you share with an unsaved person, you know, unless God's Spirit is working in them and opening their eyes, if you share the gospel with an unsaved person, I mean just by, by nature of who they are, they don't have to stop and think about it. They usually don't even think about it. They're just going to deny it. They're going to deny it. Oh, oh, no, I, that's my, that might be your God, but it's not mine, and, and, this, kind, and this kind of a thing. I think everything is just fine. I saw an example of that. You know, I, I think I've mentioned before, I've been watching some of these uh, real-life uh, murder uh, cases where the detectives work and work and work to, to find out and who the murderer is. And sometimes they don't find out for 30, 40 years. And now that they have DNA and so on, they, they, uh, they, find, they find it out. But... Um, so here you have this, uh, in these cases where um, um, the person, the victim of the homicide, for example, was obviously, I mean, I mean, I'm glad they caught the killer and so forth. Too bad this happened to the person. But nevertheless, you can tell from the details of the victim's life, right, that they were partying on in life. They didn't have, they didn't, without many exceptions at all, they didn't have any need for Christ or, or whatever. And, uh, you know, 
You don't go to heaven righteous before God just because you got murdered, right? Um, a lot of time, a lot of times, not all the time, but many times, um, if they had not been pursuing the sinful course of life that they were, this wouldn't have happened to them at all. But anyway, here's my point. At the end of this one that I was watching recently, and, and, and frequently in the others as well, the uh, surviving family members of the victim, and you, you feel sorry for them because it is a, a grief to have had this happen, of course, and it's not that we don't have empathy for them, but they choose to believe a lie. And what's the lie? She's in heaven right now, looking down upon us, right? It doesn't, doesn't matter. She had no need for Christ at all. No, you know, it was just partying on an earth dweller, as Revelation puts it. And, uh, you know, this is what R.C. Sproul called justification by death. Well, the guy died. He's justified. Before. He's in heaven. Everybody's in heaven and so forth. I was telling... Verla recently, I think, or somebody it was, you know, you drive by a cemetery and you think, I wonder if you ever went out there and looked at all the inscriptions on the, on the tombstones and grave markers. If you ever, ever see one, I suppose you might find one somewhere, probably from the old days, uh, that said something like, here lies a man who rejected Christ. He is in hell now, right? How, how would you write a grave marker for the rich man in the, in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, that kind of a thing? Well, anyway, man suppresses the truth that God reveals to him. This is the mark of an unsaved person. I've had um, many people, it's happened many times over the years, who cl people who claim to be Christians, who were members in the church that I pastored and so forth. Uh, they claim to be Christians and they, uh, they might be in church pretty regularly and they might talk about how much they love this church and they have their Bible and so forth. But, but their reaction when God's word is shared with them Right? You're talking to them, maybe you're counseling them or something or, or whatever, and you share an obvious truth from God's word with them, immediately it's like, oh, I, I don't agree with you, Pastor. Uh, I, I just don't agree with you. See, now, they're tricky. They don't want to come out and say, I don't agree with God on that. See, that would expose them, right? But what I'm saying is, their, the response that they do give exposes them. That kind of a person, if that's their response to God's word, and, and a habitual response, you know, I mean, it's different than having, you know, man, I don't, I know that's God's word, but I don't understand that. I'm, I'm having, I'm struggling with that. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about here is they just come out and say, I don't agree with you, pastor. And they immediately sidestep God's word and they're going to put the blame. It's as if I wrote it, see, that kind of a thing. Well, what, they're, what are they doing? They're demonstrating that they are ungodly, that they're unrighteous, that they are under God's wrath because you see them doing what? Suppressing the truth. I don't like, I don't, oh, I don't like that. You know, I don't like the implications of that. So they suppress it. And they do it naturally because they're children of wrath. That's, that's who they are, all right? Now, <clears throat> how can God hold them? How are we doing on time, Verla? We've been going 40 minutes. What's that? We've been going 40 minutes. Oh, man, we're out of time already. Well, anyway, I'll, I'll show you this one more point here. Um, I try to hold the Roman studies down to about 40 minutes. But anyway... Um, so, what is this truth um, that they suppress? You know, 
God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. And as I say, it's against all sinners everywhere. Well, how do they know the truth? And what truth is it that they are, that they are suppressing? Well, Paul goes on to explain. Verse 19, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them, all right? So look at this now. We'll just comment at this, and then we'll plan to pick up in verse 19, uh, 20 next time. But there's no such thing as an atheist. There's not even such a thing as an agnostic. You know, the agnostic, well, I don't... I can't say that God doesn't exist, but I don't know that he does exist, so I am, you know, sometimes they'll use the term kind of uh, as a boastful way, you know, I'm an agnostic. You know what that means? Ignorant. That's what, oh, I'm, I'm ignorant. And, and you see, well, what Paul's telling us here is, no, you're not, I mean, you might be ignorant and stupid in the sense of, of suppressing God's truth. But you're not ignorant in the sense of not knowing some fundamental things about God because all men, it says it, look at this, that which is known about God. So there's something that is known about God, known by all men, no exceptions at all. It's evident within them God made it evident to them. And later on, he will see, see here in verse 20, these things have been clearly seen. Clearly seen. Now think about it. You've got to know some things about God in order to suppress those things. So it isn't that they don't know. It's that they know and they hate what they know, so they deny it. And they actively suppress it. That's where the theory of evolution came from. All, all, all of this stuff is, uh, is a result of suppressing the truth about God. Well, we'll plan to pick up next time then in verse 20. Father, we thank you for revealing Christ to us. Thank you for sending the gospel to us and accompanying that message of salvation with your power that we might be born again, that we might be called out from the dead and given faith to believe and justified before you. And so we give you thanks for this in Christ's name. Amen.